Okay, open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. If you have a pew Bible, it should be the second yellow tab that's back there, or it's on page 196 of the New Testament towards the back of your Bible. At our last Bible study, we talked about the beast of the sea, which is the Apostle John identifies as the Antichrist. And he pops up and is, gets to be known halfway through the seven-year tribulation period, where he ends up persecuting and outright murdering people who are followers of Christ. For tonight's Bible study, we're going to talk about a, a second beast that pops up, the beast of the earth, why he's called that, what, how he differs from the first beast, the Antichrist, and we're going to get into the number 666 and what that's all about. So let's bow our head and go to our Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege to be open your word and to be able to worship you freely in this country. There's so many people around the world that don't have the freedoms that we have. We thank you that we're able to worship collectively in our private homes and even publicly in, in churches. There are so many Christians around the world that would love to just be able to congregate with their, their spiritual family uh, publicly in church. And we take that for granted sometimes, Lord. So we praise you for that. We thank you for the, for the time that uh, we can spend getting to know you intimately through your word so that we can have assurance not only of our salvation but of the things to come and that we won't be here for the worst time in human history. And most of all, we thank you for your son, for, for sending him to shed his blood on the cross and die for our sins so we can spend eternity with you in heaven. And we praise you in his blessed and holy name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to begin in Revelation chapter 13, beginning with verse 11 and reading down to the end of the chapter. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small and great, and the rich and poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Okay, last time we talked about the beast of the sea, which, as I mentioned, is identified as the Antichrist. Throughout the book of Revelation, you're going to see John refer to the Antichrist as just the beast. The reason why he does differently here is because he's talking about two separate beasts. He talks about the beast of the sea, and here we're talking about the beast of the earth that we talked about last time, why he's called a beast, because beasts are ferocious and they attack and, and they and they kill, and this that's the, the role of the beast of the sea, the beast of the Antichrist. However, this second beast is called the beast of the earth. Elsewhere, he's referred to in the, as a false prophet, which if you went to Revelation chapter 13, 19, and 20, that's how he's referred to as a false prophet. And you might ask yourself, why is he called the beast of the earth for? How does it differentiate? Well, the, the Antichrist, who is the beast of the sea, we said that that um, probably most likely refers uh, to the area of the Mediterranean Sea because whenever the word sea is used in the New Testament it refers to either the Mediterranean Sea or the Red Sea. And that the Antichrist is most likely going to come from um, some nation that borders on the Mediterranean Sea, probably like Italy or, or one of, of those. Uh, the, the reason it's called beasts of the earth, the word earth in the, in the New Testament when it's used it refers to a mainland or the inhabitable, habitable earth or it can refer to unbelievers throughout the world. And so, and so this is why he's differentiated from the, from the first beast, 
is because the beast of the earth represents those um, who are unbelievers in the world. And, and, and as we just read, um, when it talks about those who dwell on the earth, that is a term to describe unbelievers. When the, when the New Testament refers to those who dwell in heaven, that's a phrase to refer to believers. So that's a difference, and that's why he's called um, the beast of the earth. Um, and it says that he comes out of the earth, and what that's talking about is that he gets his power from Satan, because as it um, says in there, in, in the, you know, in, as, it, as it says, as we read, that uh, that's where he gets his power from. He gets this same type of satanic power and authority that the Antichrist ends up getting. And the way he's described, he's described a little differently than, than the Antichrist. Um, he's described as having two horns like a lamb. Uh, and as we t talked about in previous Bible studies, what are horns on animals used for? They're used in order to attack, and they're used in order to defend. And so that's why he's using that type of imagery. But he also describes them as being like a lamb, gentle-like, but just like the, um, just like Christ is. But in a sense, he's like a false Christ, which is why he's called a false prophet, because uh, he's described as a lamb because he's deceptively attractive. Because unlike the first beast, the Antichrist, he doesn't come to physically destroy, but rather to deceive and draw people to the Antichrist. That's what his role is. His role is to deceptively attract people to the Antichrist, this false Christ. Um, but in, in the New Testament, when I talked about um, the word earth, uh, the Apostle John in his Gospel, John chapter 3, verse 31, he says, he who comes from above is above all, and he who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Let's see. Um, and in Revelation, back in Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, when we had previous Bible studies, John writes, For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea. Because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. So again, he says, woe to the earth. And the reason he says, woe to the earth, is that he's talking about those people in the earth who are unbelievers. And in, in, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, 8, 12, 14, again, it's talking about the earth. So, so the earth is a synonym for those who are unbelievers. So questions so far? Okay. All right, so... Why is he called a false prophet? Because, again, if we were to continue reading, he's called a false prophet. So why do we think that John refers to this second beast as a false prophet? Because he's deceiving people. Right, because he's deceiving people. Mm -hmm. And if we go all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy, Moses warns that um, there are going to be false prophets in the future. And he says the way you can tell the difference between a genuine prophet and a false prophet, a, a genuine prophet is going to draw people to the one true God. And that one true God is Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus warns there's going to be false prophets and false Christs in, in the future. And Moses also stated that even the one way you can tell that someone's a false prophet, if they claim something is going to come true and it doesn't come to pass, they're a false prophet. He said, even if they do come to pass, even if they perform miracles and it comes to pass, if that prophet is drawing to somebody other than Jesus Christ, other than the one true God, they're a false prophet. And there have been false prophets throughout history. There are false prophets today that are drawing people to, towards a, a false form of Christianity. Um, so in verse 12, it, it's, it tells us what the function and the job of this false prophet, this beast of the earth is, is to give authority, he has authority to the first piece, that, that he's empowered by the same source, and that he is going to be a miracle worker. When we um, read before, uh, I think it was in Revelation chapter 11, we talked about the two witnesses you know, that come on the earth about midway through the tribulation or so, and there's a debate about, about whether or not this is Moses or Elijah, or if it's just two uh, prophets during that period of time. But one of the things that they do to demonstrate that they're genuine prophets is that they, they were able to pull fire down from heaven, and that's something that only Elijah and Moses were able to do in the Old Testament. So he's going to be given authority and power by the Antichrist to be able to perform the same sort of um, miracle. And 
the people of the earth, the unbelievers, are going to be deceived by this. But if a person's a genuine believer through the tribulation period, they're not going to be deceived by this at all. They're going to know that this is going on, you know, that this person's a false prophet. And that's because in verse 12 it says that he makes those of the earth and those who dwell in it in order to worship the first beast. The word make literally means to cause one to do something. They're going to have control or even over the minds of unbelievers during this time because as we're going to read, the apostle Paul says that God is going to allow a great delusion on those who have rejected the truth. So, But for those who are genuine believers, they're going to have no power to be able to make um, be genuine believers in Christ to worship this false beast. And we're going to explain what the word um, worship means in a little bit. Um, actually, we can, actually, we can go ahead and do that right now. The, the word worship, if you look up on the board, it literally uh, comes from a Greek word that means to fall upon the knees and touch the ground with the forehead as an expression of a profound reference. Now remember the word forehead because this is going to be very, very relevant and important later. Um, and you see this in false religions like Islam. If you ever see uh, a Muslim worship, you know, in, in their um, in their temple or whatever it's called, their their, their um, the mosque. Called? Mosque. Yes. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Their mosque. Yeah. I should know that. <laughs> yeah, in their mosque, what do they do? They kneel down on their knees and then they go down on their forehead, and bec and that's because they're worshiping Allah, which mm -hmm. is a false god. It's it is not the god of Christianity. It's not it's not the one true god. <laughs> it's, it's a false god. So that's what worshiping is. It's a kneeling or prostration to, um, in, to do in homage or differential respect. And it's used of homage of beings of superior rank. You see in the New Testament where individuals will be even be worshiping and bowing down to the Jewish high priests, which they weren't supposed to be doing. Or, or they worship the one true God. They worship Christ. And they even worship heavenly beings like angels and demons. And the only person that you're supposed to worship and bow down and worship to, you know, is, is Jesus Christ because he is the only God, the, the one true God. For example, in Matthew chapter uh, 2, this word for worship is used when the Magi, when Jesus, after Jesus was born, worshipped the child Jesus. And when they did this, this was much later. This is when he was a toddler. You know, a lot of times we'll see movies of the Nativity, you know, and the Magi come and worship him as an infant. That didn't happen. It wasn't until later after Joseph and Mary were in a house and they were living there in, in Egypt and um, and uh, they, they came when he was a toddler so he was a little bit older. Or in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus says, You shall worship the Lord and serve him alone. So this is the only person we're supposed to worship. But during the tribulation period, um, the false prophet, the beast of the earth, is going to force people to worship the Antichrist, and if they don't do this, they're going to be killed. And people who are not genuine believers in Christ, they're gonna, not going to lose their lives, um, and, and, and not for for the sake of not worshiping. And that's going to be the way you're going to be able to tell the difference between a genuine believer, you know, and an unbeliever. <clears throat> so, so keep your fingers here because we're going to come back. This is our main text, and we're going to go to Second Thessalonians chapter two. If you have a pew Bible, it's page one sixty one. It should be the first yellow tab that's sticking out of your Bible. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we read this before, but because it's relevant, I wanted to go back and, and uh, review it again. And we're going to start with verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come. It referring to the day of the Lord. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. And I want, to, want you to remember this term, object of worship, because we're going to explain this. Uh, so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Now drop down to verse 9. That is, the one whose coming is in accordance with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence 
so that they will believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged and did not believe the truth, but took pleasant in wickedness. So at this point, everybody's going to know the truth. They're going to know who the one true God is. They're going to know that this is Jesus Christ, but they're going to reject that. And when they reject that, the Apostle Paul is saying that he's going to give a diluting influence, and at that point there's a point of no return, and these are the people that are going to take the mark of the beast and, and worship the Antichrist. So they're going to be without excuse. And, and if you look back at verse 11, it talks about deception for those who will perish. <coughs> those who are deceived are going to perish. You know, there, there's, there's no question about this, because they're going to take that mark. And in verse 11, it's because he says God will bring a deluding influence on them, uh, and they will believe what is false. So uh, comments or questions so far on this? Okay. Um, let's go back to our main text in Revelation 13. And before we actually get to that point, but go back there, go back to the main text. I told you to, re to remember that word object of worship that we just read from the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians. This word, this term object of worship comes from a Greek word. It's, it's, it's the word sabasma. It only appears twice in the New Testament. And it refers to that which is religiously honored or an object of veneration. And it includes uh, worshiping at temples, altars, statues, idolatrous images, something that is adored or an object of veneration. In fact, in the Darby translation of the Bible, instead of it saying object of worship, it says object of veneration. In a lot of churches, they will venerate not just individuals and in, in quote-unquote saints, but they will actually venerate the actual carved image of these individuals that are in heaven, whether it's a carved image of Jesus himself or Mary or Joseph or whoever else. That is actually, and according to this Greek word sabasma, veneration is no different than worship. They're worshiping that object. And the other time it's used is in Acts chapter 17 when the Apostle Paul goes to Athens and he's noticing that there's all these statues of all these pagan gods that are up there and then there's a then there's a platform that doesn't have a statue and it's to an unknown god and so Paul takes the opportunity to say this unknown god that you're worshiping that you don't know about it's Jesus Christ it's the one and only true god all these other gods are false but what they were doing is that they were venerating these images they were worshiping these images they were going down and bowing down on their knees before that and that is a form of worship you know and when the antichrist comes during the tribulation period as we read in, in revelation 13 he's going to cause un these unbelievers to actually create this image and have them bow down to it and and you think to yourself that's a bit of a stretch, but it's really not because people do that today. Again, you see Muslims do that. You see false forms of Christianity do that where they kneel down and bow down before the image and venerate them and not realizing that they're actually worshiping this this image because veneration is no different than than uh, than worshiping. It's it's not a matter of semantics. That, that's exactly what's happening. Questions or comments so far? No? Okay. All right. Because like I says, Chris, if, if anybody wants to speak up, you know, and that's why I take breaks or whatever, anybody wants to say anything, has a question, sometimes I go a little fast and furious, you know, with the Bible study, and I tell people, if you want me to slow down, I'll slow down, or, or you want me to clarify something, I'll clarify it. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, and, then, and then if you notice in verse 12, when he says that this fatal wound was healed, what this is, what this is, is, is a false resurrection. And we know this because in verse 14, when, when we read, it talked about the wound of the sword that was healed. So what's going to happen is that the Antichrist is is going to be attacked. There's going to be an attempt on the life of the Antichrist. And, and it's going to appear that he's going to be killed. But because he's powered by Satan, people aren't going to be able to kill the Antichrist. He's going to um, have this false resurrection. And the only person that that's happened with is Jesus Christ. And as we read from the Apostle Paul, he's going to demand that they worship him as God. And that's why he's called Antichrist for it. When we think anti, we think against or opposite. But the term actually means in place of, of Christ. And so he's going to say that he is Christ himself on earth. He is God. And the Christians, the false Christians, are going to worship him. You know, And at that point, even people that aren't Christians you know, are going to worship him because they're going to see this for them, 
this miracle right in front of their eyes. And they're going to trust in what they see rather than what they should be believing through the Word of God. You know, and that's why Scripture alone is so important, because if you begin to add to the Word of God, you could be easily deceived. Mm -hmm. But if you base your faith on, faith on um, Scripture alone, which the Christians during the tribulation period are going to be doing, they're going to be able to tell the difference between the real thing and the counterfeit. So... Um, so in verse 13, it says that he, meaning the false uh, prophet, performs these great signs, including making fire come down from heaven, just like the two witnesses did in Revelation 11, and they will deceive people into worshiping the Antichrist. And in verse 14, it says that he deceives those who dwell on the earth. We already told, mentioned that those who dwell on the earth are unbelievers. That's the term to describe unbelievers, to make the image of the beast. But then at some point after this, the Antichrist is going to abolish um, false religions throughout the world because what's going to happen is that the Christianity is going to get diluted because there's going to be an acceptance of all religions saying, oh, we all worship the one true God. We all worship, you know, whether you're worshiping Allah or you're worshiping Brahma, which is, which is the god of Hinduism or some other type of false god. And as a result, the Christians are going to be looked at as being intolerant and um, because they're saying, no, you should only worship Jesus Christ. But there's going to be a point where he's going to, the Antichrist is going to abolish all uh, false religions and have them solely worship him as, as the one true God. So keep your fingers here, and we're going to go to Revelation chapter 17. It's only a couple pages over. It's on page 198. And we're going to start in verse 3. Again, we read this before, but it's relevant, so I thought we would read it again. Revelation chapter 17, starting in verse 3. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. And we talked about last time about what the seven heads and the ten horns are, you know, this refers to the rulers in the past and kingdoms of the future, so we're not going to go into that. If you want more information on that, you can look at the last Bible study. But that's what it's symbolic of. Verse 4. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead, a name... See that word forehead? On mm -hmm. her forehead... A name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. When you think about the abomination of desolation that the prophet Daniel talks about in the Old Testament, this is it. Verse 6, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. Believers in Christ are going to be persecuted and tortured and murdered during this period of time. And this mother of harlots, this, this woman, this scarlet woman, this abomination of desolation is going to be responsible for that. And, it's, and she's part of this, this false religions of the world. So drop down to verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. Notice the word wisdom again. The seven heads are seven mountains on which this woman sits. And some people think that the seven mountains refer to Rome because in John's time, the city of Rome sat upon seven hills or seven mountains. And they are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. The beast, this referring to the Antichrist, which was and is not, and is himself also the eighth. And the reason he brings this up is because the reason he's the seventh and the eighth is because he's going to be assassinated and then brought back to life. That's why he's the seventh and now the eighth. And one of the seven, and he goes into destruction. The ten horns, which you saw, are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom. This is why we know this is talking about the future of, of John, who's writing in the mid-90s, because these ten kings do not have a kingdom yet, so it's yet future. But they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. So the whole purpose of this woman is to draw people to the Antichrist. Drop down to verse 16. And the ten horns which you saw, and the beast, these will hate the harlot, and will make her desolate and naked, and will eat her flesh, 
and will burn her up with fire. Verse 18. The woman whom you saw is a great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So the great city, as we know, is Babylon. We just wrote that. And Babylon is symbolic, is all the same as the scarlet woman. So this imagery of this scarlet woman riding on this on the Antichrist, riding on this beast, symbolizes the great city Babylon. Now whether it's the actual city of Babylon, um, the Bible is not specific about it, but it may refer, but Babylon a lot of time is a code name because Babylon is the mother of all false religions. And when the Apostle Peter is talking about being in Babylon in his epistle, it was a code word for Rome, and that's why a lot of people think that this is talking about Rome, which certainly fits because again, Rome sits upon seven hills. You know, so whether this is definitely Rome or not, or it's that part of the world, people are going to find out. Now, we're not going to find out because we'll be raptured, we'll be gone because we're part of the church. The church isn't going to be here. But um, I don't want to be around when this happens. But he might let us watch. He, no, because we're going to be sitting at the, at the feet of Christ worshiping. So, no, he's, he's not. He's no not, tears we're, in heaven. We're not, gonna, we're not yeah, because people in heaven, they can't see what's That's going right. on down here. No because tears in heaven. There's no I tears know. in heaven. And, and like I says, our focus is, is on Christ. You know, everybody, Mary, everybody. So. so so going back to our original text, go, go back to Revelation chapter 13. And if we go, go to verse 15, we talked about this before, the, the, the false prophet or the beast of the earth gives life to the image of the beast, the abomination of def desolation, which you can read about in uh, Daniel chapter 7. And this, the, it, this image, this physical image that is being carved, was is, a, is actually going to speak. And this is interesting because idols generally don't speak if you read the Old Testament. So it will speak, and this Im the, the false prophet will cause the image to kill those who will not worship the beast. It will have this type of power, whether the image does it himself or it tells its followers to go out and, and, to go out and kill uh, believers in Christ. Um, the point is that this image is is going to be responsible for the death of countless Christians during the tribulation period, which I want to reinforce, even though there's going to be believers in Christ during the tribulation period, this is not the church. Because as we've talked about in other Bible studies, before the tribulation happens, happens the church will literally be raptured up to the sky, meet the Lord in the air, and he will take the church to heaven. Because when the rapture happens, Christ doesn't come down to where we are. We go to where Christ is in heaven, and then at his second coming, he, we come back with him to the earth when he plants his feet on the, on, on the Mount of Olives and defeats the Antichrist and the false prophet and Satan for good. Um, yet, there are, there are going to be people during the tribulation that are going to be protected. Back in Revelation chapter 12, when we covered that, it tells us that... that um, God is going to protect the Jews. He's going to take them into the wilderness. And the earth is actually going to protect um, the nation of Israel from the devil during this time. And, and this is, needs to be done because when the Jews pass into the millennial kingdom after the tribulation is over, they're going to repopulate the earth. And we know this is, is because there's going to be nations during this time that's going to expand for a thousand years when Christ returns and sets up his millennial kingdom. And, um, and I know Mikey got a question, and then, but also some Gentiles are, Gentiles are spared because in Matthew chapter 25, he talks about separating the sheep and the goats, and he says there's going to be sheep from all nations. So there's going to be Gentiles that are going to survive as well. Also say the 12 tribes of Judah, the 144,000, I think so we were just referring to in Israel. Will they all be living in Israel to start of the tribulation? You think some of them might be able to, like others might be able to escape the United States, other parts of the country to go back to Israel, become part of the 144,000? Does it state? It doesn't state specifically that they're going to be actually physically in Israel. You know, they could be spread around, but the only thing that it, that it says is that he's going to take 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of, of um, Israel, mm -hmm. and they're going to be the witnesses for Christ during the tribulation period. They're not going to be 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. No, either, that's, so. that's comforting. <laughs> Thanks. But, yeah. So, the, so basically... Yeah. They actually do survive the tribulation, 144,000. Yeah, least. and, okay. and, and it's, it's kind of funny you bring that up because in our next Bible study, in Revelation chapter 14, we're going to be revisiting the 144,000. They're going to be brought up again. So, And a lot of people think that this is when the, the second coming happens. 
um, because it's talked about Jesus being on uh, Mount Zion, which is a symbol for, uh, for Jerusalem, and the 144,000 are with him. But we're going to talk about that next time. So okay. that's, that, that's, right. a, that's a little cliffhanger and plug for, for the next Bible okay. study. So okay. good, So that very good questions. Yeah, so again, in verse 16, it says that he causes all the small, the great, the rich, and the poor. So nobody's going to exempt. Whether you are a pauper or whether you're a billionaire, you're going to have to take the mark. They're, they're, it's not like you're going to be able to pay the Antichrist off. He's basically going to say, it's like, I don't care how much money you are. You don't worship me, you're dead. Mm -hmm. So everybody is going to have to worship. So you basically have two choices. Either you die and, you know, and not take the mark or you take the mark. And when Christ comes back, then he'll kill you. You know, so it's like, so kind of take your pick. But at the same time, like I said, there are going to be people, Jews and Gentiles, who are going to survive and pass into the tribulation period. So, all right, so, and it says he causes all those to take the